Ready? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> hey everyone, I'm Christy. I'm Aizia. And we are doing the Qualitative Election Study of Britain, Cardiff edition. <laughs> so we get to report our first Cardiff-based vlog for our focus group research. And last night we did the second of the televised, well, we call them debates. The third one's not going to be a debate, but the leaders' appearances on television. And Adzia ran the group last night in the first half of it before the debates. So I'm going to go ahead, uh, we're going to have a little discussion about the challenges and other things that happened around Cardiff how the group went before the debates, how we thought people were reacting to and working on their data collection during the debates, and what they thought about how it went. So, I guess the first thing is about recruitment. Yeah, so, um, like we mentioned in our pre-focus group vlog, recruitment, uh, we followed the same procedures as we have in the past for recruitment. Um, and, as in the past, we also ended up uh, with a few last-minute dropouts. Now, um, when Christy did the, did the 2010 general election focus groups, um, she tried to over-recruit to compensate to some extent for um, dropouts. But I think this time, because we had already kind of maxed out on our recruitment for the Dundee focus groups, we were not sure if we could over recruit because if we did end up getting everyone, we would not have the money to pay them. So we decided that we would go with the number that we uh, had in our budget. But of course that meant that when we had the dropouts, we had to scramble to get last minute uh, uh, people to fill in at the last minute. And so we spent about a couple of hours last afternoon, yesterday afternoon, emailing people frantically saying can you please the space has opened up uh, it's on a first come first serve basis uh, would you be interested in participating we did manage to get so we had two dropouts um, the original group was planned for seven uh, two dropped out so we ended up with five and then we ended up getting one uh, participant who agreed at the last minute two or three hours before the focus group was supposed to start um, she agreed to participate uh, and so we ended up with finally with a group of six. Um, I, when I checked my emails last night, I hadn't heard from anyone else. <laughs> so we were very lucky to end up with a group of six, because otherwise we would have um, had a smaller group. Mm -hmm. um, so I think um, one of the things we wanted to reflect on is about um, dealing with this problem of last minute dropouts and um, and what we can do about it. Yeah, I think the best, well, the most obvious strategy is just to stay vigilant on people replying to us and to emails to saying they were canceling and having kind of a deep bench in terms of identifying potential replacements and just staying on top, but also having some flexibility that, yeah, people are going to drop out. Uh, so we try to mitigate it, understanding that that's a very likely thing every time we have a group. But as you say, you don't want to get, you don't want to anticipate dropouts and then over recruit for every single focus group and run out of money mm. by the end so that your post-election focus groups all have to be with four people because you don't have enough money to pay six or eight across the country. So yeah. we're trying to walk that balance of getting enough participants in, but also not spending money fast, you know, at the front end and not having any at the back end. Mm. So, yeah. So the, um, I guess for the next a uh, couple of focus groups that are taking place tomorrow. This is something that we are going to have to pay attention to today as well because we may, and I mean, who knows, we may, end, actually we did end up with a dropout yesterday for the focus groups that are taking place tomorrow. So I, I had to then send out emails yesterday mm -hmm. uh, to this deeper pool of participants saying a place has opened up, would anybody be interested? So that's the other thing that we have to take care of um, till t this afternoon. Yeah. And see if there are any dropouts for tomorrow. And just keep on it and tomorrow morning too before we leave the hotel, just check one more time and yeah. and see. If nothing else, just to know that someone's not coming so we don't wait for fifteen, you know, five extra minutes and then they don't turn up. So That's right. Yeah. And you know, the, life happens. So dropouts are just kind of a, a a thing that you don't want to deal with but you should always be prepared for. That's right. Yeah. 
So the second thing was then um, setting up everything, getting ready for the focus group, mm -hmm. getting there. Um, and things proceeded quite smoothly. In fact, I think for the first time, we were or half an hour before schedule. Yes, and yes. so we were just sitting there twiddling our thumbs, waiting for everybody this is to weird. turn up. <laughs> <laughs> um, and one of the great things was Roger Scully, who's on our advisory board, was our liaison here in Cardiff, and he organized the room and made sure that we had the tech, that we had access to the. Um, digital equipment we could get online. We did an audio visual test where we brought up like, a YouTube clip and we turned everything on and ran it to make sure the sound worked so that we had confidence when we got in there um, because we had a little bit of a problem. I think we lost like the first 30 seconds just because um, in the last with the 15 people um, everybody was talking and you needed to get a comfort break out just to like leave the room and then suddenly it was like ah we need to turn the screen on <laughs> so everything so we've gotten that down now that's that's fine but um, yeah on the technical side that went like a dream and we also didn't have as much room prep so we weren't physically altering the room in order to make it focus group friendly and that saved us a lot of time yeah and we had a student volunteer mm -hmm. as well which was very helpful um, and he and another student so we'll have two student volunteers tomorrow which again save us quite a yeah. bit of time especially um, since we're probably only going to have about 30 to 40 minutes yeah. we'll get in there about nine o'clock and the group is meant to start at 10 so we yeah. want to be done by and be ready to greet people by 9 40 so that's a lot to do you know but we'll have less technical demands this time it'll just be about setting up the cameras in the room and the paperwork and the payments and the payment sheet and mm. uh, keeping yeah, that kind of stuff yeah yeah, so then uh, people turned up uh, at yesterday's focus group well in time. In fact, I started 10 minutes before yeah. the uh, scheduled time. You got an extra minutes of basically 10 free minutes of data collection. Yeah, that was brilliant. <laughs> yes. Yeah, um, And I could, uh, I think because of those 10 minutes, the first question that we asked, I could spend a little bit more time probing everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, I would have had to rush through it. In any case, you were worried. I was. I was not going to finish in time. Because <laughs> I was sat there and I knew, I, because I was, um, so we had the student assistant, the room, to get to the room was quite complicated and it was getting to be about the time where people would start arriving so we sent the student assistant to kind of go and greet people at the door and give them directions and then I would stand outside the hallway there's a really long hallway and I would sort of stand at the end of it and be like are you looking for the focus group yet this way and so when um, I had gone to fetch the student because he didn't know everybody had arrived you had already started and it was 10 to 10 to 7 Yes. And I was like, oh, this is great. We get like an extra 10 minutes of, of, of data collection. And then Adzia asked that question and it lasted till quarter after seven. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was sitting on the other side just freaking out. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, she's got this question to get through and she's got the leader's exercise and this and this. I'm like, there's not going to be enough time. There's not going to be <laughs> enough time. But I was wrong. She totally managed her time, managed to squeeze every drop out of people. And we had... Um, enough time to have a comfort break, but then also set up the students with the social media experiment and get the room set up for people to do the leaders reports and to hand out the leaders reports before the actual debate started. So it worked out in terms of timing really well. But you felt the whole time like you had it under control. Yeah, I felt like I, I, there were, like I was mentioning it this morning. Um, there was some things coming out from the participants which I felt was very useful for us in the terms of in terms of richness of the data, and I I was trying to walk that line of not stopping them before they give you that gem of a of insight, uh, but not letting them ramble too too long because that's not going to be helpful. Um, so trying to find that balance and making sure that everybody had that input. Um, as well, um, because I think the first question that we asked them was, is one that is going to be quite relevant for us mm -hmm. for this election? Yeah. Um, and and we had all most mostly undecided, mm -hmm. or at least non-partisans in the group, um, and getting insight into what um, is driving them to make up their mind was something that I thought would. Yeah, um, set the tone for the rest of the focus group. And by way of explanation, we actually have a sort of a, a recommended time length to make sure that the moderator, whoever's running it, can kind of peg when they start and get a sense of how long the question's been going on and then move on to the next question so you make sure you give every question enough time. And that question had been listed for, like, 10 minutes? 15. 15 minutes, yeah. And you went for 25. Yeah. And that's why I was freaking yeah. out. <laughs> yeah. So it wasn't just like I thought she was, you know, it was like, we're on a time thing, she's gone over. 
over, but she totally had it under control. Uh, and I think I was lucky in a little w- a bit because I would probably would have had to cut people off. But the la- latter questions that I asked them, so for their impressions on the debate and mm-hmm. all that, um, um, they did not really have a lot to say uh, on oh. the latter questions, and yeah. so it kind of you know went quite quickly toward the end. Uh, toward the end as well, yeah. yeah. So that helped wrap it up Mm. a bit faster. So yes, um, and the first question that we asked was the one that we had kind of a little bit of an insight into in terms of how people make up their minds. I don't know how much we really want to get into preliminary revealing the data, but um, in terms of our methodological approach, what we wanted to do, Roger Scully was quite interested in this nexus of people voting for parties at different levels, at the council level, at the assembly level, and at the Westminster. And that was the question that you spent a lot of time kind of pulling out. And maybe, do you want to talk a little bit theoretically about why that was important? Well, I think at the end of the day, what we are interested in is um, what drives people to make a particular choice in terms of they were, so why do they vote the way they do? Um, and Roger was interested in trying to find out if there are different drivers at different levels of government, at uh, different levels of elections. Um, so I, um, I I wanted to make sure that we give him and give ourselves enough of uh, data to be able to answer that question and to be able to see if there are any differences. So. Um, is it policy, is it party, is it candidate that drives people's decisions at each level or are there differences? So it's candidate at one level and policy at another and party at a third or whatever. Mm-hmm. So I think, yeah, that's where I'm yeah. thinking about it. And yeah, do you want to just kind of then give a summary about how you felt like the first half went? Very well. Um, yeah, the participants were, were generally really, really good. Um, a couple of participants who were very much engaged in the whole process and who gave us quite thoughtful responses. Uh, the group as a whole worked really well. There was not anyone who wanted to dominate or mm-hmm. was um, extremely outspoken or uh, in the sense of you know ha- inhibiting other people from speaking. So uh, and it was a small group. It was about six people around the table. So in that sense, it was quite intimate as well. Um, yeah, I, I thought that the rapport between the uh, members of the group was quite good, mm-hmm. a, a good feel for it. Yeah. yeah, and they were kind of politically aligned. I mean, it's Wales, so it tends to be, or at least the, the where the constituencies that we were drawing from, we didn't draw from any that had sort of like a natural conservative base. So I don't, did anyone say that they, someone said they had considered voting or would consider voting conservative or had voted conservative in the past. But I think that there was more of like less of the UKIP side of sort of the political space spectrum um, and so they tended to have very similar values and critiques and sort of cited and they had differences like they disagreed on like later on on um, Natalie Bennett's performance mm. to some degree and we can maybe talk a little bit about that but generally they were they had a rapport going on because yeah mm. I mean I think the other thing that was very interesting was that they were um, there were some things like you said like for example Natalie Bennett's performance uh, where people quite uh, were quite um, ob- uh, vociferous about their disagreement, but not in a way that would make somebody else feel um, that their opinion was being devalued or that their opinion was wrong. So not attaching mm-hmm. any value labels. They were more like, I don't agree with you. Mm-hmm. This is what I think. Um, but yeah, that, that's just me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we try to encourage that, sort of let people willing, willing to step up and say, oh, I don't really see it like that. From my perspective, it looks like this kind of language um, to get a variety of viewpoints. Mm-hmm. And yeah, we had actually like, you know, two people who basically were in similar political wavelengths um, having a bit of a back and forth about what debate should be about. Should mm-hmm. they be very stage managed and pre-prepared or should they be quite spontaneous? And it was a little bit off the topic but it was an interesting exchange back and forth and it was quite respectful and I think they kind of both ended up realizing that they agreed, they just kind of were coming at it from, from different like uh, perspectives, mm-hmm. you know, in terms of how they were approaching what was important. So, mm-hmm. Yeah, that was my impression as well. Impression, yeah. yeah. Yeah, they were a good sort of self-moderating, polite. Mm. Right, anything else on we want to talk about pre? in terms of the pre? No. 
Okay, then the debate itself, I guess, moving on. Um, hiccup. <laughs> right, so the debate, we got going right on time and had the audio up for the start of it. I was a little bit freaked out because when they started, what they started to do was to go to other reporters to advertise mm. the things that they were doing afterwards. We're like, no, we don't want to see any of this, just in case they, they try to they say something that would influence our, our, our respondents, our participants. But that it all went off basically technically wise without a hitch, which was good. And we had two people who alternated between using social media and doing their report cards. And some people were very like note takers through the whole thing, and some mm. people would just make notes occasionally. Mm. And um, we also, this time, because we did have four people in the last group who did not give a final mark. And we had, oh, and the other thing, the debate was only 90 minutes long, mm. which we didn't realize. Mm. <laughs> but it was good because it meant we could keep them for a half hour afterwards mm. and uh, get out of there early. Mm. So we kind of, it was a win-win for us. Mm. It was a nice change, to be honest, mm. to getting home at like almost midnight and then still having to write the press releases or get some stuff out on Twitter while we could. But... Um, what was I saying about the, oh, the length of the yeah. debates. And so, um, yeah, then we had the full half hour afterwards. But during the debates themselves, nobody left the room, you know, nobody yeah. got up to get food. Um, they seemed quite comfortable. Um, and yeah, they, they were very attentive, basically, throughout the 90 minutes. So I think they, in, well, we know later on that they did enjoy the debate and they were very much engaged in watching it. And another thing that we didn't realize was going to be happening was that at least on I don't know what happened on the television broadcast but on the internet broadcast on the basically I want to say almost the lower half it was huge in terms of the screen but it was probably the, lo the lower 40 percent not 50 percent of the screen had a worm and a line of positive and negative feelings toward what was being said being monitored for the entire length of the debate and it was tied to 50 undecided voters that had been selected by Ipsos Mori in order to be representative of undecided voters and so while everybody was speaking underneath them this line was bopping or going down or coming up and doing this sort of wormy thing to mm. show reactions and we hadn't known that was going to happen mm. and maybe that it's kind of our fault for missing the detail but in all honesty these debates yeah would we i don't think they would have uh, advertised yeah. that the worm would have been there there's no maybe. way that we would know unless we actually you know thought of it in advance and called up bbc or <laughs> yeah. are, you and said, do... are you going to do the worm yeah uh. <laughs> it might have been one article but we were too busy recruiting people who were canceling yeah. at the last minute but um so that just added an element that we had planned for but because qualitative research you can adapt to changing circumstances we just ask them if they like the worm and we'll yeah. tell you what they said and in, in the post-election discussion so yeah. more about during the debates am i missing it yeah um, we uh, like yeah, you already mentioned it, but just kind of to be uh, clear, we asked the participants to fill in the leaders' debates report cards, report cards yeah. like last time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's basically it. Yeah, yeah. And then we just sit in the back and yeah, watch them write for an hour and a half. Yeah, I found the worm very dis uh, distracting. I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> I just yeah. found it so distracting. I couldn't pay attention. I had to force myself to pay attention to what was being said yeah. rather than follow the worm. So, yeah. Yeah, I think for me, um, more because I am interested in how people react to things. And also because I haven't, I know that they say that they have these in American debates. In all honesty, I've never seen a worm live during a presidential debate. I've never seen like the Romney, you know, president clips with that worm underneath. And maybe that's because I'm not living there and I'm not watching domestic television. But I'd never seen... Um, an actual live worm during a live debate. I've always seen it sort of afterwards and the reactions. So as a cephologist, for me to see what people were reacting to and not, and sometimes not reacting to, was important. Because there were times that I, um, for instance, I thought it was really funny when there was a moment when David Dimbleby kind of stepped on Nigel Farage when he made an allegation about the makeup of the audience. And the worm went up. <laughs> and so I thought it was... <laughs> <laughs> I like, it was the thing I wasn't expecting about the worm, as I wasn't expecting the worm to be reacting to David Dimbleby, mm. and that for me was a, quite an insight. That you have, you can't really say that the worm, what people are reacting to over this delayed space of time, is purely down to the politician, because if they start having a back and forth, then it becomes very complicated to know what um, what 
people are actually responding to. But the one thing I did notice in terms of patterns was that although Farage was in the positives, I would imagine the analysis afterwards would show you that he his highest point was not as high as any of the other people on stage, mm. and his lowest point was much lower than everybody else on stage. So his range seemed to be locked in at a much, let's say, a step down from all the other leaders. Mm. And the other thing that I noticed about the worm that I found quite interesting was, you know, you'd mentioned that Natalie you thought Natalie Bennett's closing was quite strong. Mm -hmm. And that was another observation from a, a respondent that they thought her closing was quite strong. And I did notice that in her speech, actually in the beginning, I think she talked, it got very, very high. Um, and so she had some, I think, some of the highest like peaks. Mm. And I think Nicola also had some really high ones that lasted, but I think her negatives were also more profound. So mm. I think people are more polarized by um, Sturgeon than by Bennett. Mm. And maybe that is part of that, um, her uh, sort of being lagged a bit mm. comparing, even when she's saying basically the same policies. Mm. So for that reason, you know, for mm. the totally geeky reason that nobody except somebody who, you know, is obsessed with politics would want to watch The Worm and think about these things. For me, that was interesting, but I completely understand why viewers would find it very distracting and why one person in our group said that it was interesting, but more in a neutral way than a positive way. Like it was an interesting thing, mm. but I guess if we were to feed back to the BBC, don't do it. Or reduce the size. Reduce the size or make it an option on like an alternative channel. You can watch mm. it with the worm on this channel or watch it without the worm on the main channel. But, but basically I, it didn't seem to go down very well in our focus groups. Mm. Yeah, and in fact, I think one of, if people are not clear what it is, if we had one participant yeah. who said, what was it? <laughs> yeah, because in order to describe it, if you hadn't seen it, um, so this lower 40% of the screen, it had a, it looked like, it looked like the hotel uh, uh, pop up a, a plus a negative sign here, right? So right dead center um, was, I guess, no emotion or neutral reaction. And then there was just a plus sign and then a slightly larger box and a slightly smaller box and then a line and then the negative. And so basically it was like a thermometer, mm. but they didn't describe it as being a thermometer. They didn't put a name on it. Yeah. And the other confusing thing they did was when the line was moving up and down, the background of that the box that the worm was in was just cycling through the colors of the parties mm. purple green yellow red whatever and so there was no intuitive way to understand what the up and down meant for instance if they had had yellow whenever it was within a certain range it was yellow and then as it went up it got green and the color would change to green as people liked things and then it would drop down below the neutral level and it would start to get redder and redder and as people say you know, negative mm. uh, signals then you could figure out what it was but like you said if, if people can't just look at the screen and go what the hell is that is it mm. how she was like is it how often they tell lies <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the best. yeah i love that answer i wish we could but <laughs> yeah yeah so, because there was no explanation of what the worm was mm -mm. when david the movie started either yeah, um, I was and so unless you, unless there was something in the pre-coverage which our participants didn't listen to because we didn't want any media effects. Mm -hmm. So if there was something about the worm in the pre-coverage, then obviously people who were watching the debates would know about it. But if our they participants, that, yeah. yeah, if they watched that exactly. Yeah. But anyone yeah. who just jumped in two minutes in or yeah. five minutes in would have, you know, again inferences but no clear knowledge. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. BBC, our recommendation to you. <laughs> Um, so then the post debate yeah and then like wrapping up yeah we wrapped up on time and we also again to to avoid media effects we always turn it off before basically anyone has an opportunity to react to the debate and we missed the hug yeah, because apparently. we did that we mm -hmm. missed the hug yes the picture yes so we were kind of more paranoid about that but I, in some ways i'm kind of glad we didn't get the hug in that way i mean maybe you could consider it part of the debate but i think it might have colored Mm. how people perceived the women and their interactions perhaps mm. as the um as they reflected on it mm. so maybe that methodologically is something we should note mm. you know because we have the video and so we know exactly what time we turned mm. it off and we can report that and what people didn't see afterwards mm. um, and we can have discussion about balancing out that yeah should we leave it on and see how people react as they le debate leave the debate stage or mm. should we cut it off after the talk because we want people to react to what happened during the debate not what happened after the debate mm. 
that's mm. a discussion we can we can have. Or it might just be we can't shut the computer down <laughs> too fast enough for people get the exposure. But it won't be a problem next time because they're not debating. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, post debate. Mm -hmm. So, I did the post debate part. Um, I took over from Edzia to do the last half hour, and as with the Scottish debate uh, group, we put the questions about the debates themselves first, except for the worm one, which I'd forgotten because it was I had to handwrite it and it was at the bottom of the list. So I'll deal with that one. We kind of already hinted. Mm. Not a big fan of the worm people. Like I loved it, but. You know, I'm clearly not representative. I was outvoted seven to one, basically, on the worm. Um, so don't do the worm again. And uh, we asked whether or not they thought the debate was fair. And people did. People mm. were generally, it was a universal show of hands, and they thought it was fair. They didn't even really have any complaints about, you know, um, people talking over each other. There was a perception that Miliband spoke more, but participants realized that that was because as the sort of de facto incumbent of the, on the stage, he was the only one who could reasonably say, as Prime Minister, I would. And also that um, a lot of the party leaders were actually yeah. targeting him with, with questions. questions. Like, so, Ed, what do you think about this? Or will yeah. you agree with me on that? Yeah. And so the participants did realize that one of the reasons he was talking so much was because he was being asked questions directly by the other mm -hmm. leaders yeah. to respond to. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So they didn't feel that that took away from the balance um, of the debate in any way. Right. What she said. <laughs> and the other thing, oh, they, okay, so we, they didn't like the worm. They um, they thought it was fair. They thought uh, David Dimbleby did a very good job moderating. They thought he was fine in terms of managing people and the crosstalk and allowing people a back and forth. He was also, um, well, we'll come to that on the moments that stand out. But yeah, Dimbleby was a player too, just like Paxman mm -hmm. was in that first interview. You know, you had the worm people reacting to him. We had our participants reacting to the moderator. So that might be an interesting sub piece perhaps over the course of several debates is the role of moderators mm. and what people pay attention to but um I'm trying to think of anything else on the structure of the debates am i forgetting because they're pretty no. easy questions yeah. was it fair was it well, well moderated um we also asked them you know are you glad you watched the debates and did you learn something and again people think debates are important they think they are a good part of the election campaign and they felt like they learned something and they felt like walk away you know with more information so for all the maybe concerns about the presidentialization of the debates or their nature, they focus on personalities, not parties, there is still a general perspective that it's better to have debates than to not have debates. Mm. The, our participants definitely said that they wanted more specifics on policies. Mm -hmm. uh, they felt that quite a few of the leaders did not go enough into the detail of their policies mm -hmm. um, and they felt that um, a few of the leaders said this is what they're going to do very generically without actually saying how they're going to do it and the participants felt that they should have gone into the how and they should have gone into the you know nitty-gritty more clearly more yeah. clearly because what they're looking for in this case if they're undecided voters is they want to be able to use information to help them make a choice and if everyone's saying we should be nice to each other and the world should be a better place mm -hmm. there's not a lot of difference between there and the kinds mm -hmm. of differences that they were building weren't policy were always policy specific so I think one person mentioned they're being really impressed with uh, Nicola Sturgeon's very strong defense policy so it was something that he hadn't expected from her but her rationale of okay if we're gonna eliminate Trident then we have to really invest in our conventional forces and we have to secure our borders and we need to make sure that those are ready to go and handle whatever our, our military or defense needs are mm. and you know he responded very well to that because it's an argument that makes sense and it's actually got some policy connotations mm. that's a lot better than you know some of the more wishy-washy platitudes so I think in terms of debates what I would recommend to the leaders is go out on a limb and, and actually state some policies yeah. one of the things we found from Clegmania that people really responded to is people said he had specific numbers he had specific ideas he mentioned specific things mm. and people I know party leaders and, and politicians don't want to be caught in these, you know, the minutiae of specifics. Yeah, but, but that's what undecided voters seem to respond to. Yeah. Um, is the specifics because they've heard all the wishy-washy stuff before mm -hmm. and that hasn't helped. And they're not going to vote for you just because your labor and their labor. Yeah. You have to give them a reason. Yeah. And those
Policy specifics. Policy specifics. Okay. All right. Well, I guess we should wrap this up because mm. it's the battery is dying. Mm. <laughs> we haven't had a chance to charge it from last night because we got in so late. So, um, other things. I guess in some ways I will. I, okay. Well, I was like I'm almost tempted to charge it up because there are some exciting things we want to put out. But I guess we'll we'll wrap it up here. Um, highlights. I think it was worth putting on the vlog. So uh, there were three moments that kind of stood out to our participants as the moments that they were, uh, the people rec throughout as the moments of the debates that they will remember. One was um, the whole exchange between Ed Miliband and Nicola Sturgeon on the uh, coalition. Mm -hmm. And generally around the room, it was felt that it made a tactical error. Um, that they could they build. understood why he made the error, why he yeah. said it as well, but they felt it wasn't a, a mistake, an error. Yeah. That his sort of adamance and shaking his head just came across not in a very good way. And that she handled it, I think a lot of people expressed being impressed with her uh, around the table here in Wales. Um, another moment was when uh, Nigel Farage had accused the audience of being BBC sort of lackeys and just a bunch of lefties that were there um, on behalf, um, behalf of the BBC. And Dimbleby just crushed that allegation and shot him down. And the respondents said that that was actually one of the better moments <laughs> of the debate. And there was a third. That I can't remember. Me neither. Uh, there's a th well, we'll tell you some other time. Um, generally, the highest marks, so we did the A to F. We also this time gave people to give their final marks and give comments. And it was sort of Nicola was got the highest mark by one person, but then she was also in a higher sort of range with Ed in that mm -hmm. uh, AB sort of category. Mm -hmm. And then under that was again sort of a clump of... Um, uh, Natalie, Natalie Bennett and, and Leanne. Uh, Leanne Wood yeah. and then of course Farage at the bottom yeah which is interesting because in both our focus groups Farage has just been at the bottom but if you look at the polls um, he's not so, uh, necessarily yeah. and so, we won't be able to get any reactions to him in England which is too bad because of the way the debates are structured mm -hmm. but we will have the impressions um, data so mm -hmm. we'll be able to compare people's impressions in in the in England and Birmingham and in Essex County compared to um, Wales and Glasgow. So since the battery is dying and uh, we're pretty much to the end anyway, I think we can basically say what we're off to do now in terms of our next is just recruit, 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 make sure we have enough people for tomorrow. And we'll talk since the battery's dead, we'll do a longer post vlog on the Saturday one, maybe on the Sunday, talking about the questions we selected and how the groups ended up turning out, whether or not people turned out the weather's supposed to be really nice Saturday. <laughs> so hopefully nobody will call in sick just because <laughs> of the sun, but if so, we'll cope. So from Cardiff, I've been Christy. And Edzia. <laughs> <laughs> She's always Edzia, but yeah. I'm in the past tense. And we'll see you guys uh, after the Saturday focus groups. Yeah. Bye. Bye.